This is the last uh, lecture of the classical mechanics section of this course. And since it's named advanced classical mechanics, uh, we would normally stop there, but then we've already agreed to have a lecture on the thing that is on your desk right now, namely Unit 8, at the uh, Thursday day next week. One meeting? And that's um, basically going to be a, a two-hour, since that's a time period lecture, and we'll break in the middle of that to, you know, stretch your legs and uh, uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about. So um, right now we're looking at uh, Unit 6, and I'm going to dismiss this uh, screen and uh, start the lecture. There was a question lecture. about the precise time we were supposed to meet on Thursday. Um, precise time should, I guess, be uh, the uh, 12.30 time, if yeah, everybody time. could make that. Even though so it shifted by 15 minutes. It would have been 12.45 otherwise. If that's okay with everyone, um, you sure maybe we'll, we'll do it then and go for two hours from there. Yeah. Okay, so far uh, we've uh, mostly been dealing with things that involve a, a single particle or maybe two of them on the very first uh, collision stuff that we started. We've come back to that collision business and the lab versus COM uh, frame views, but now uh, uh, dealing with th three dimensions. And then we're going to go on. Uh, most of this uh, lecture today will be about the uh, rigid or semi-rigid uh, uh, bodies. That is something that you just throw into the air and it tumbles uh, in a really beautiful way. And we found some new ways to look at that that uh, then carry into the quantum mechanical discussion of uh, molecular spectroscopy, which is the course that I'll be teaching in a uh, spring semester, the, the winter semester actually, since the spring comes at the end of it. But um, anyway, uh, today I want to very quickly go through, once again, lab versus COM frame views, but from a somewhat different uh, point of view. Okay, um, basically we just imagine uh, two, two uh, objects, perhaps, and most likely if you're thinking of a molecule, something is holding those two at a, very close to a, a radius that is the difference between the two three-dimensional vectors that define their location, and that there'll be uh, uh, between those two a center of mass, in this case center of gravity if it were feeling gravity. And we've already talked about this, except that when we did it, we didn't have a vector, R1 and R2. We simply had uh, coordinates, uh, each one being one-dimensional. So th this is uh, not too different from what we've already done, except we do treat it quite differently. And there are two ways to look at this that are, I, th I find uh, uh, very useful, particularly in um, atomic and molecular physics. So um, the mass-weighted average that we talked about uh, in the very first lectures uh, has a similar formula, weighted uh, sum, literally weighted by the m1 and m2 multiplying each one of the uh, coordinates. And what we're going to do is undo that uh, equation and give the coordinates, the actual r1 and r2, uh, in terms of uh, well, in this case, the mass 2, in this case, the mass 1 for coordinate 2, but vice versa for coordinate 1. And um, that, that transformation, and I'll try to follow uh, along on this screen uh, with um, the uh, uh, relations that we need later. W with that uh, transformation, uh, we have really two ways uh, to look at uh, this. The normal way that um, you'll find in almost any textbook starting with sophomore physics and then 
a different way. We call this one the Ptolemetric view, the idea that, uh, as Ptolemy uh, would describe the uh, planetary system that we live on, uh, from the point of view of the Earth, and then the Sun and everything else, presumably everything in the entire universe, would be rotating around that. And that, that works for a while, except as uh, you probably already know, almost all of the uh, planetary motions then become cycloidal uh, and, and very complicated. Uh, so th this, I claim, useful for some things, but Copernicus says, no, you should look uh, at the planetary system from something that is, at that time he thought the sun stood still, and in some sense it does, but it of course is involved in, as we have talked about um, last, uh, le the lecture that involved the uh, solar wind uh, version of Rutherford scattering, is um, moving rather rapidly uh, around our galaxy, etc. And then the galaxy has, also has velocity goodness knows with respect to what depends on your um, viewpoint. So this is another way to do it that you don't usually see uh, in uh, ordinary textbooks. In any case, uh, Newton's third law, the conservation of momentum, basically, that the force 1, 2, that's uh, on mass 1 due to mass 2, and presumably there's some kind of force law that we're going to have uh, that's only a function, this is isotropic with respect to the individual mass, only a function of the distance. Uh, each of these are separated by, and that's this number right here, the absolute magnitude of R1 minus R2. But um, we've got a force 1 on 2, and then we have just the opposite, force 2 on 1. Okay, and presumably the force that we're talking about uh, will be a conservative one in the sense that uh, momentum of this uh, whole uh, system uh, in the center of momentum frame will be zero. But um, that just making a minus sign right here uh, 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 does that. And you can see here uh, F12 is written in, the, uh, in, in terms of the uh, force as a function of the uh, radius, radial di distance this, uh, with the unit vector then there's the unit vector, and then here it is uh, using that thing as a, as a difference, which is what we, as our, as our first equation uh, right there. And then this is just has a minus sign here. So what we're going to basically do is solve this thing by taking the difference of these two uh, right here, so that when I subtract it, I'll be adding that uh, one there. <clears throat> and then, of course, if you take the uh, uh, sum of this two, uh, that should come out to be zero, and the way we read it, it does. So this is Newton's third law, action, reaction, cancellation. And that's what we look for in all of these things. And then once you have done that, and then do the difference between these uh, two M A, Newton's M A equations, uh, you get, it uh, looks like a fairly complicated thing, thing, but it settles out rather nicely. And the thing that you're dealing with here is the uh, reduced mass. We basically come down to equations like this involving the uh, R that is R1 minus R2, the separation R that, uh, the, between the two masses, M1 and M2. Now this is called a reduced mass for a reason. I'll explain that just in a second here. But for the moment, uh, the way to think of it is that you're doing an inverse sum and then you get the inverse of this. So 1 over mu, very obvious, it's just a simple sum, but of an inverse of the masses. Okay. Now, when you do that, then uh, it always, at least um, in, in cases where these are not equal, that is, if you have a mass m1 that's really large compared to m2, just the opposite of this figure up here, which has a little m1, that is an M2 that is greater than M1, then this expression here for the reduced mass, just by a, a simple binomial or 1 over 1 plus x thing, it becomes 1 minus x dot dot dot, you can see right away that uh, the reduced mass um, is a reduction of the number 2 mass. 
Similarly, uh, this one, if it's the um, little guy, uh, here the M2 is the little guy, um, the uh, reduced mass is M2, but a little less. And it subtracts it. And then this one, same thing, subtracting it. Now it's a different ratio. Okay, so I, I see that's the reason for calling this reduced mass. It uh, always is slightly reduced in cases uh, that like we'll, we'll deal with here. Okay, so then it's in an equation like this, and that's the telemetric field. Okay, now, instead of rescaling um, the masses, this view rescales the coupling constants that, that are inside uh, these forces. And we have two forces that we deal with uh, in the last few days. We've got the isotropic harmonic oscillator and we've got the Coulomb. We do both of those again. Um, and we'll be rescaling the constants K uh, in both of those to get this view. So that's what makes this view a little weird. Okay. In any case, we've got the same equations that we've, we would deal with up here um, and um, are written uh, down there at the very bottom. Uh, but um, the actual acceleration equations, things that you stick in the, on the computer, are a little bit different. So I'm going to bring this guy uh, up here and um, we'll run into the uh, end as well. So uh, here's where we um, say, so I'd say just one more thing to say why it's redu we'll call it reduced. Okay, so here is um, what we're faced with. If we're going to follow this Copernican view, we're going to make use of these uh, two uh, um, re relations, R1 and R2. Um, and uh, then take that equation and rewrite the force law in terms of a rescaled coordinate, R1. And uh, for the other force, it's going the other way in terms of the rescaled coordinate uh, with respect to R2. And e each of these uh, have the relation to that force. Uh, this is 1 on 2, and this is I'm sorry, this is the force due to 2 on 1. This is the force uh, due to 1 acting on 2. Okay. And anyway, this is what comes up. And it's an equation uh, involving, uh, what, let's just say, one of the masses. We'll pick the heavier one uh, to be our center. And then uh, we'll get something like that if we're talking about uh, the uh, Coulomb case, where the force is k over r squared. Now we're going to get a k over r1 squared. But the coupling has changed. You see, it's been changed by a product of masses, m1 squared in the denominator, uh, mu squared in the numerator. And we'll do the same thing with a harmonic oscillator, except now it'll look a little different. Now the coupling constant is scaled simply by the fraction m1 over mu, not the square. So the force, the form of the force law affects uh, how you pick different coupling constants in order to uh, carry out this, this particular view. All right, um, go ahead and put that uh, on this other screen. Now, um, let's just take a look at uh, what it is that stimulated me to do this, and that was it seemed to me that we were so successful at getting a geometrical description which mirrors the amazing symmetry that these two particular force fields has. Uh, could we do the same? Could we do a geometrical construction of a two-particle orbit where they're both moving now and they're com you know, comparable masses? Okay. Before this, we tacitly assumed that the center was an enormous mass that just didn't move at all due to this little fly that was going around it. We're not making that assumption anymore here. Okay. So let's look at uh, the simulations of the equations that result from this, and you can see, just by looking at the picture that we have there uh, pretty well, uh, and I'll go over here to actually run the, the simulation. Um, let's do uh, the, um, I think the, 
uh, prettiest one is the Coulomb one. So we'll do that one uh, 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 first here. Make sure, make sure I'm on the right screen here. There we go. Um, now we could do this in a lab frame, but it just marches off the screen. So I'm going to do something that's more like the uh, the uh, Copernican uh, view, but in the lab frame. So this this is what it does. They dance around each other. Center momentum does not move, and I can do a ruler and compass in construction of either one or both of those because it's the same as it was if the thing in the center was infinitely heavy. Okay, so that, that was the motivation uh, for the crazy coupling constant modification that I was uh, talking about here. Now, uh, while we're at it, it uh, doesn't hurt uh, to go ahead and look at uh, the harmonic oscillator, uh, isotropic harmonic oscillator uh, force and potential. And I presume we can get that working too. Okay. Very different looking, right? Same idea. The radius between these two is always uh, having its center of momentum or mass right here. It's, a, it's the center of gravity and it's the center of momentum. Okay. It's the same with that one. Okay, does that make sense? That's uh, what we're after. Now, w once I found that this was a success, the next step was to say, hey, could I do this in the, in the actual lab frame? The lab frame where we start with one of them at no velocity. Is that possible? Okay. And as you're going to see, for very good reasons, it's a complete bust. And that's due to the logarithmic long range uh, of the Coulomb that uh, is the one that we really wanted to do it. You know. For the oscillator, we don't really need to do very much, but the Coulomb is nasty in this respect. So, uh, let me um, leave the Coulomb there for a moment and go back uh, on this one uh, to the um, lecture slide here and point out uh, some of the things that happen when we take these uh, uh, constants of the force and multiply them by various uh, functions of the masses Things that have to remain the same, okay? The orbits are going to differ in sizes relative to the difference in mass. That's easy to see. They differ in placements of the center, Coulomb place, oscillator place, okay? That, that's easily seen uh, just as a function of mass ratio. Orbit axial dimensions, that's a little more complicated, okay? And we're talking about A1 and A2 versus the A, involving masses, and then the reduced mass. But it turns out that is exactly what you want, is this particular uh, a set of 1, 2, and then the reduced, 1, 2, and then the reduced mass, multiplying uh, A, B, and the lattice radius. Okay. Now eccentricity uh, of orbit, that better stay the same. Okay. <coughs> Scaling this big and small does not this should not change the eccentricities. You can see these orbits are uh, each thinking they're very special and like a single particle orbit. But the oscillator periods they're going to be uh, all over the place. So here, uh, what you do is if you want to look at the period for this thing, you you uh, if you're doing your uh, what we were doing, we had the uh, we would have reduced mass over k. But it's got to be equal to the mass 1 over the k1, and that would take care of this orbit, you see, uh, in the Coulomb case, okay? And, and then the, the other orbit, m2, is going to have a completely different uh, thing, but they better be the same period to match, right? And they do. And, and that's true Coulomb, or oscillator, and then, as I said, the eccentricity must match. Okay, so this is the algebra of this crazy Copernican way of looking at the things. Now, it's Ptolemy who's crazy, or, or I should say behind the times. This is more advanced and works. Here are the energy values also uh, being shown so that they each satisfy their own, let's call it sum relation and uh, 
proportionality relations. So th that's an interesting thing about this. Okay, now, here's one thing we didn't do in the um, very first lecture <coughs> where we simply did uh, sphere collisions, ball, super ball collisions, uh, uh, iso energetic ones. There was uh, on, only a few cases where we considered uh, lossy collisions. But um, I'd like to take, take a quick look here at um, something you should know as a physicist anytime you and your friends go out to the pool hall. Everyone should know that when you use regulation uh, cue ball and all the other numbered balls, particularly the eight ball, if you're going to play eight ball, right? One of the things you want to avoid when you're playing a silly game is that when you try to knock this ball in a pocket, you don't want to be sending this one into a pocket also, because that ends the game in your disfavor, right? You, you, you guys have seen these rules, right? And the way to tell that is to realize that whatever you're aiming at, there better not be a pocket waiting at 90 degrees to that. That's the, the key, key uh, uh, idea. If these are two of the same mass, now some pool tables have them different mass, and it's a whole different ball game, <laughs> literally. Okay, but you know, regular times, this 90 degrees shows up in the geometry. You see, all we're doing is we're here's this center momentum view. Okay, they go out like this, and then they go out like this, always balanced, right? Uh, no matter how they happen to scatter, uh, whatever angle. Uh, they scatter it, and that should have been a theta right there. Um, this uh, uh, here is the result of saying, no, I want to look at this thing from the point of view of the ball that started uh, stationary, namely this one. And then I hit it with this one, and they both flew. One of them this way, one of them that way. Where in the center of momentum, they were both here, and then they ended up you know, on, on these lines in this graph. Okay, so it's simply a translation with a vector velocity that is equal to this particular one, the number two one. Right? So there's the geometry. That's it. It's Cayley's geometry again, right? This has to be a 90 degree angle. So that's cool. And let's just run a, 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 a here a hard collision of, from the point of view of the CM frame first. That's it, okay, that hits the wall, but that's the collision right there, okay, and then uh, I'll stop this, go back, and we'll run it again, only this time in the lab frame, okay, same thing now, but if I was riding along with it at the center of momentum velocity, I would have seen what the movie uh, that we just showed, right, so th this is something we didn't do with bounce it. Uh, very much, if at all, uh, before, because we, we made everything go on a single dimension, right? Here's as much as we can do uh, when we let them go in two dimensions. Okay. Now, what about the lab view? Is that constructible? That's the question, okay? So, uh, what we're going to do here is, uh, first of all, look at the simulation. When it comes to doing a simulation with a, with a Coolo program like that one, uh, well, really, there's no problem. Let's look at the center momentum frame first. Here they go. Repel each other. Coulombic force, and off they went. This freezes very nicely uh, with the stops that you, you, use, you put the terminal time uh, off here uh, to some value. Uh, that lets you uh, stop there. Okay, uh, I can construct this uh, much geometrically in the center of momentum. But what about, and now let's go back and start the uh, lab frame, okay? That's the lab frame, okay? Lab frame is that this guy is sitting as it is in uh, early particle physics in a bubble changer or something like that. Uh, there's a, a Rutherford's case where the, the gold nucleus was, was stationary. And now we're imagining it has enough energy to knock the gold nucleus off on a, a trajectory. 
uh, yeah, I could, uh, maybe I should be able to construct that. And then I should be able to figure out where the asymptotes are for this, and where the asymptotes are for this, right? Lots of luck. Didn't happen. We got to see why. This was this this caused a little bit of a dispute with the referees, but um, if I just said this, he probably let it go, and it's wrong that I can construct that I can, and we'll see why. Okay, so let's uh, go back to uh, the original lecture here and uh, go forward uh, to this. Okay, so this is the uh, paper that was done as a class project exactly the number of students that we have here. We haven't gotten around writing paper yet, why not? Maybe we still will. I mean, we didn't actually get the paper done until quite a few uh, months or even actually a year after the class, but um, this is uh, where it came in. The idea of given the center of mass scattering, you know, from a construction by ruler and compass with a mass ratio of two to one in this case, uh, we get this diagram. So looking at the velocities, I can do that with the ruler and compass. No problem. That's easy. But the actual trajectories and all the stuff that goes with it, woof. Okay, this is figure three of this paper. I'm going to read it to you slowly. The scattering begins with both particles infinitely far to the right. So there's a uh, two particles, one of them standing still at infinity, the other one uh, even further infinity coming at with the initial velocity. In other words, the lab frame is in hell. <laughs> it's an infinity, okay? That's what you need to have in order to really describe this entire scattering process. The Coulomb field's infinite range, and this is showing it right here, okay? So, the heavier particles at rest and the lighter particle is moving a third of a mile per day on the scale of this, well, this is a blown up scale, so uh, it'd be a little faster on this one, but in the scale of the drawing of the paper. When the heavier particle first appears, you see, here it is coming on the scene now uh, at uh, minus 10 to the 6 uh, seconds, okay? My, Minus a million seconds, we're counting down here, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, to the actual collision, which will be here, all right? The other particle, the other particle is still over 100 miles to the right. So you need big pieces of paper for this construction, right? <laughs> really big ones, all the paper in the universe, okay? So, uh, but it's extremely, extremely slowly left for well, the lighter particle is still over 100 miles, right? So this thing is creep, 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 creep. By 100 seconds, it's here. And that's the day of the collision. Oh, we're on the day of the collision now from here on, okay? It's, it's going fast enough. You can actually see it creeping, okay? And finally, the lighter particle arrives in this picture and moves through in about 12 seconds. Minus 5, 0, plus 5 seconds. That's the collision and then this thing takes off. And that's what we saw with our motion uh, picture just a minute ago. We didn't do this. <laughs> Class not long enough. Okay, so that's the, the, that's the thing that puts the spoil in this thing. Basically, you're asking what the velocity number two is, and here's a rough calculation. It's, it's uh, based on t to the minus one. Where, where the things are going uh, uh, at linear speeds. And integrating that sucker gives you logarithm. Okay? So this is what you have to deal with uh, when you're talking about Coulomb scattering of two things or more. Now, where are the asymptotes? They're anywhere you want them to be. Here, 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 depending on how long you want to wait. You can wait a thousand seconds you'll have an asymptote right here. You want to wait a million seconds, it would be about here. They just keep creeping. The asymptotes keep creeping. Now their angles don't change much. So very soon you deduce where the angles are. 
that's easy. That's part of the construction uh, that we already uh, know how to do of the velocity uh, addition. But the rest of it, no dice. Now you think maybe attraction would be better? Same deal, except now they creep in from the other side. Creep, 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 creep. The so-called fixed particle going here at imperceptible speeds for years and years until finally it's sucked up to this point and at that point they go through and do their, their scattering. So, if you were thinking about doing a geometry on a Coulomb scattering of two particles, you see the a logarithmic problem, really hard. Okay, now uh, the next thing that I like to talk about is just the basic Newton's equations. That's F equal derivative with respect to time of momentum, but now with angular quantities. That is uh, some sort of a body. I'm going to take a boomerang as the, uh, as the uh, example. Um, got one here. This is not an Australian, this is a Rocky River, Ohio boomerang. Okay. Far more deadly than the ones that come from Australia where they are actually used uh, in wars and, and uh, mainly for hunting. The boomerang has um, a, a, a sort of a dance it does uh, uh, that causes the animal to uh, half the time duck the wrong way. And that's the way you kill uh, uh, animals, uh, birds. If you've ever tried to throw a stone at a bird, I mean, I was a little kid, I was mean, you know, I threw this, kept trying to hit the bird with a stone. And the, the bird would just wait until the stone was about here and go, whoop, and the stone would go right by. Boomerang, uh, half the time, the, uh, for a good aborigine, okay, uh, will get the, get the prey. So that, that, the boomerang fed a lot of people on that southern island. Uh, nowhere else I know of anyone uh, hunting that way. Okay, now, uh, here is uh, just a rundown of something that's in sophomore physics. This is where you uh, figure out what is the Newton's equation for angular momentum in the most rudimentary fashion uh, that uh, you can explain to uh, students in a sophomore course. But this kind of stuff, if you've uh, probably thought on how we're doing here, but this kind of stuff, the rotation stuff, tends to be unpopular for uh, both the teachers and the students and, and maybe entirely left out. Uh, we're trying to avoid that, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you can see that by the end of the semester when everybody's tired, this is not the kind of thing that you uh, expect a lot of people to be uh, find popular. In any case, the idea of having uh, constrained, constraining forces holding a rigid body together so that, that uh, they don't stretch, this would be a rigid body, so rigid that the forces that are needed to keep them at a particular uh, location uh, are um, not changing the distances that are associated with them. So uh, if that's the case, I'm going to keep those uh, I'm going to imagine uh, whatever distances are constant, but maybe the forces aren't depending on where the thing is going, because there's lots of, of, of applied forces that will be uh, uh, imagined uh, for the system. But the only thing, and this is what's really kind of a, a problem, is that um, if you, um, in order to do this, uh, you, you have to uh, have uh, the forces be directly on the line between uh, the uh, uh, particles. Uh, weird kinds of magnetic forces and things like that that point in different directions. That's also supposed to give us an equation like we're going to get, but it's a lot harder uh, to derive that one. This one, you just get uh, the differences uh, right here, and you discover that those cross products add up to nothing. So the constraints play. Uh, uh, no role in the motion of this. Now we know that constraints play no role in this because of our Lagrangian um, uh, heritage of this course. So uh, I don't have to, you know, go through the details of getting this particular equation right here. Uh, we know that that's the case. In fact, we know it's the case for forces that might pull obliquely, provided they 
uh, weren't supplying momentum. So this is the key thing, though, for the arithmetic of this one. So you end up with a rotational Newton's equation when you're all done, where the torques, the N, the actual applied force, is R cross F. And um, that's the sum of each of the R's cross whatever applied force uh, is uh, uh, present at, the, at, at their due electric field, magnetic field, you name it. Uh, you've got to add all those up. But that will then determine the derivative of the angular momentum defined by just a sum of r cross p's. Now this is really quite beautiful that this, this, this works, that this is a, a way we can describe rotations. Because we have not that good a visualization of rotations. And I would like to show you the things that we've done to improve that uh, visualization. So this is. This and the translational Newton equations are independent um, mechanics uh, that's emphasized, that should be emphasized in your first mechanics uh, course. But if this is your last, here it comes again. Okay, now, um, I think at the moment I'm going to also bring this computer back to the lecture um, mode and advance it uh, so we're in the neighborhood of a uh, discussion of the boomerang. Okay, How do you visualize what the, a torque does to an angular momentum that is this? Well, pretty much the same way you visualize what the force does uh, to a, a P. You get that force and it, it causes the P to in increase uh, in the direction of the force. But this is weird here. This N thing here is a cross of, of the uh, R with the F. So well, what do you do with it? So I'm using the boomerang here uh, to help you, in a very complicated system, uh, understand that and visualize that. So the basic idea here is that this boomerang will fly, uh, and I, the kangaroo must have come and, and, and taken it. He's hiding right here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't want me to have this. But anyway, the idea is that as this thing flies, you imagine you throw it like that and get a good spin on it. So it's going through the air. It's got translational velocity. It's, it's also got rotation. So um, you've probably heard the sound effects. If you haven't, we've got a song coming up here uh, that uh, has those uh, sound effects. But basically the sound effects are right? Now, where have you heard that sound effect uh, on the news? Anytime there's a helicopter, right? When the helicopter is moving, right, this wing right here is cutting the air a lot faster than this one here. Difference twice the velocity of the helicopter linearly, right? Well, boomerang does the same thing, okay? It goes, you can hear it. It really, really makes a noise. Okay, this one does anyway. Um, some of the other boomerangs that you can buy that are made of light wood are also wonderful, but this one really performs if you, uh, if you have the space to use it. Um, the amazing idea is you're going to have a higher lift. This is a wing right here that's shaped like an airplane wing. And then on the other side, it's shaped pointing the other way. So this is a right-handed boomerang. It's got chirality. And uh, as it goes, there's going to be more force on this side than on this side. So there's going to be a torque that's coming out of the board here. In other words, you just go with the force with your fingers, and the torque, the N vector, that's going to turn the L is just your thumb. So your thumb is going to pull this L this way. And that's what makes the boomerang over a big circle uh, go around and if there weren't any other effects, it would just go all the way perfectly, start to drop a little bit, but it actually has quite a bit of lift. So in principle, it could come all the way around like this and be at that angle when it returned to us and we'd better duck. Right? But that's not uh, the total story. The, the, the total story is, and this uh, I'll put on this screen as well, okay, is that this wing here is cutting through. This wing comes up this way 
and it cuts through some of the air that's, that the a wing has thrown down. You see, the, the, they call, a sailors call this bad air, right, from another sailor. A sailor has a, 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 a wing and a wind coming off of that. He's taken the wing, deflected it. This wing, wing here has deflected the air this way, so this, when this wing hits it, it gets knocked this way. Okay? How does that happen? Well, there's a small lifting torque associated with that bad air of a leading blade hitting the trailing one. So, what that's going to do, if your angular vector was this way, the bad air torque, which is now this way, you see, is going to rotate you uh, up to level. And that's the basic idea of this particular boomerang, is that if I throw it right, uh, it comes back, actually rises a little bit, and stops. A perfect throw is to have it land at your feet. That's pretty hard to do, usually over there or over there, or through a broken window, way over there. <laughs> that happened, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But that's the basic idea. Now, uh, a three-wing boomerang has a much stronger effect like this, and they tend to, uh, you throw them like this, they'll level off and go the other way, make a figure eight. Okay, so three wings uh, are not, you know, they're really hard to control. Okay, they're, they're all over the place. But uh, that's just, I, I'll warn you. Okay. So as I say, in 60 files, when we did this, made this thing, I literally filed it out of a big aluminum plate. Uh, it flew 18 seconds. That's a long time for a piece of metal that you've thrown, right? That is a really long time. Hover return. Okay. Now, we'll wait till uh, the end of the class to come back and play Charlie Drake's famous song, My Boomerang Won't Come Back. How many people know this song at all? Nobody? Okay, it's really old, but it's very cute. It says, I'll read it right now. My boomerang won't come back. I waved the thing all over the place. I practiced till I was blue in the face. The original song is black in the face. That's been changed. Uh, I'm a big disgrace to the Aborigine race. My boomerang won't come back. And it's a whole bunch of verses like that. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to this uh, uh, in a short time here. But uh, in the meantime, I want to actually use this uh, n equal dl dt uh, to just look at a gyro compass. Okay, these uh, Euler ball here has a dynamics uh, that we can do. We'll spin up the ball and then uh, look at the effect of uh, applying uh, an alpha torque, a torque for the alpha dial, the dial that supports the uh, main wing here. Uh, that supports the secondary wing, that actually supports the gyroscope. Okay, so what we're going to be seeing uh, here is that uh, directly. And I don't know if I've, uh, I've shown this uh, yet. I may have mentioned it to some people after class, but right now I'd really like to let you see it, and you can come and play with it later on. But it is really quite spectacular. The idea is that if I get uh, this ball um, and it, it's got some inertia to it, so it, it spins for a while. But if I go this way, it's quite, not, it's quite happy to stay there. But if I go this way, it wants to turn over. And in the process of turning over, of course, it's, it's loose here, so it just goes this way. But then it's, oh, oh, too far. And so it oscillates back and forth around uh, the direction that it wants to be, but it, it went too, too fast, so it went past it, right? So that's, that's the thing to really see here is that if I've got angular momentum up like this, and then I apply a torque this way, okay, that's going to straighten it out, right? If it was already leaning, it's going to pull it back up, right? But if I put a torque this way, well, it's going to turn it over, okay? So same torque this way. I go this way, whoop, goes over, right? And then hunts. That's the hunting of a gyro compass which is all written uh, here. Uh, it tends to line up the z-axis may go past z, definitely will go unless you've got some kind of braking on it, and that's what gyro compass has to have, and then do a processional or hunting motion around where it wants to go. Okay, so th that's the uh, basic idea uh, of uh, the gyro compass. In that, you have this really high speed uh, gyro compass mounted sort of like this, 
uh, it, it'll feel the Earth's rotation and point, try to point along the axis, which will usually be inclined. This is not anything to do with magnetism, but it's analogous to it. Just as the cyclotron thing is analogous to the little ball that did the precession that you saw. Okay. So, um, that's the way all the ships used to uh, figure out where the heck they were because magnetic compass is pretty lousy. Uh, magnetic lines are all over the place, especially if you go near where they, uh, most of them are coming out of the crown. Okay. And even in Arkansas, there are places where the compass is off 25, 30 degrees from the magnetic. So, so you don't have a geo, geo chart with the magnetic lines on it, you know where the hell you are. Until you get GPS and you throw all that stuff away, right? Until the GPS goes down, right? And then you got to get it all back out of the closet. <laughs> That's going to happen probably at some point. Anyway, um, very high speed ball gyro compass will, will seek north. It takes a lot of speed though to, to feel something that's going around once every 24 hours. But that is, that is cool. Now this is analogous tendency for spin magnetic moments. And when we did our, our equation with Stokes vector, right, we saw how simply a two-level system gives you those equations that we uh, struggle with in classical mechanics. Uh, and I think that's an important thing. Now the general rule that is the quantum mechanical rule is the gyro tends to line up so they're rotating with whatever is most closely coupled. So when I uh, have this thing rotating this way, and then I put a little bit more rotation on it's happy with that because it's kind of lined up with it, right? But if I go this way, it wants to get lined up with that, and so it has to do the flip rule. Now, why would it want to line up? Well, any angular velocities that have a difference is the beat frequency. So if you're going this way against it, you've got a huge beat frequency. If you're going with it, you don't have it, and it's trying to reduce the beat frequency. That's what drives everything, beat frequency, right, in quantum mechanics. Here it's working in classical mechanics behind the scenes, right? And that's our last lecture, is to look behind those scenes uh, using waves. Okay, enough of that. We're in good time here that I think we can... Uh, spend uh, some time looking at some of the details of uh, just throwing things in the air. What do they do? Uh, what do satellites do is they tumble uh, in space uh, or uh, worse, how do you control tumbling uh, in, if you're riding in a spacecraft? Uh, what, what, what's uh, going on there? So what is the kind of motion that you could have in general uh, for a now we're going to do a rigid body that has some angular velocity. We use omega for that, like we have before. And angular momentum will let L be that for until the very end of this uh, discussion here. And uh, we're uh, going to um, have that L just be what we talked about uh, before, briefly, the R cross the linear momentum. Okay, R cross. Uh, something that is omega cross r. So we've got a triple cross here. So that, that's going to be a sum over all of the masses that are in some molecule. Okay, a little triangular molecule, we've got a sum to three here over the three uh, r vectors that represent uh, the position relative center momentum of the uh, mass number one, two, or three. Well, you remember the triple cross relation that goes to a dot product. Uh, that's what we use. And that produces for us something called the rotational inertia tensor. So uh, taking this triple cross to get that uh, gives you two, two factors. One of them is just a, 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 a unit, which would be a unit matrix up here. Uh, and then uh, this is a, 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 an outer product, one of these kind of products that makes an operator uh, of two vectors, two position vectors. In this case, uh, each of them uh, for the same particle. So every particle, one through n, gets one of these terms here, a tensor term to go with it, describing its, its inertial properties. 
So you end up uh, with um, the angular momentum. This is just the, the R part. But what you end up with uh, is this thing right here involving the omega uh, thing. The angular momentum uh, that's right here uh, comes uh, in uh, to that to give us this whole thing dot with omega. So the, the basic idea is that this is going to be one of our quadratic forms that converts uh, something that's velocity-like into something that's momentum-like. And that's what, one of the reasons we spent so much time on looking at the geometry of quadratic forms. We don't have to go through that again. It's going to be fairly obvious uh, what you get uh, with that. Um, in this case, a 3x3 three three matrix. Uh, most of our quadratic forms are 2x2. Two two. Here's a full three-dimensional uh, one. So every one of those coordinates, x, y, and z, presumably in the frame of whatever the object is, and we've got lots of molecules sitting here that we're going to use uh, some of them for demonstrations of this. But here I just take a, a, a simple case, a bent axle, rotating in a fixed bearing. Okay, so this bearing is presumably nailed to the stars, nailed to a very heavy workbench, and uh, we, we're going to give it a spin, so it, it, it's going to, if the bearings are really good, it's going to go around in a circle. But in the process of going around in a circle, it's going to be applying a torque uh, to all of the things that we've used to attach this bearing, to keep it from moving. And there will be a vector uh, that describes where this thing is, at the moment, it's right there with that vector. And the idea is that uh, the uh, inertia matrix is going to describe that, uh, is going to be acting and giving us where the angular momentum is due to this omega. So we're going to take this omega, which only has one component, multiply it by the tensor that that thing gives uh, on this vector, and uh, I'm sorry, on the omega vector, this being the thing that makes the tensor, and that will uh, tell us where the torque is. So here are all of the uh, components of this particular mass. At that particular moment, and you see uh, uh, with this setup, th these are all functions of time. So everything here is going to change in the next instant. But at this moment that's shown, uh, that's the uh, matrix, a little two by two matrix, uh, an A, B matrix, right? Uh, uh, when you recall our balanced and our asymmetrical diagonal A, uh, a matrix. Uh, this one doesn't have anything but a unit on the diagonal uh, times one half. So that, uh, that thing there then applied to this vector gives this. So there's where the L is. So you can see that the L is off axis. So this L is being jerked around. There's a derivative of L that is huge, if this is a high frequency, uh, that is applied to this thing. So this thing is feeling a torque like that to break it loose from whatever is holding it. You've heard of balancing tires, right? Putting those little lead, weight, lead weights, it's this in a nutshell, it's so you don't feel it in your car trying to keep yeah, that you, hanging the, the um, looking around. <laughs> um, weights have, are a little off axis, so if you don't get them on the other side, then you have a little bit of this. In addition to the up and down, uh, that's the linear uh, translational uh, wiggle that you would see. The, the, but putting it off center like this would give you wobble. Or counteract an, o yeah. an offset already yeah. existing. Yeah, that's what you're trying to do is, is, is counteract it. Okay. Um, Anyway, um, <clears throat> this is just finishing that uh, particular thing to get uh, the angular, mag angular momentum. So th that, that's the simplest uh, you know, example I can give just of getting L from omega. Uh, bearing torque then is uh, another way to look at it. It's just omega cross L because that's the uh, thing that's giving you L dot. So the torque is, is uh, being applied by uh, <clears throat> its motion, basically, the change in momentum here. Now, 
kinetic energy is another uh, thing entirely. Sum of, of mv squared, that's sum of cross omega cross r squared, uh, dotted, because we have to do the uh, vector uh, thing here, uh, leaves us once again with an inertia tensor between two omegas, these two omegas. So once again, we use a, a identity associated with the epsilon tensor. But this is a Gibbs way of writing that. So that's what gives us uh, this thing and this thing right here. Here's the inertia tensor again, just sitting between two omegas. So here is a quadratic form made by this inertia tensor out of angular velocity vectors. And uh, if you put a half on it, that is the total kinetic energy uh, associated with this. This is Dirac notation, okay, uh, being applied to this very classical entity. And here are the coordinates if we have uh, some over, say, three particles, if we're thinking of a triatomic uh, molecule or something like that. So, most of the time, what you don't want to have uh, is a tensor where everything in here is time uh, dependent, like it was for that crank, bent crank. So what you do is you set yourself up so you're always looking at this thing in the uh, very special frame that diagonalizes this to that. So now the big X, Y, and Z will be uh, assumed to be that particular direction. A, a singular direction, only subject that you could can permute the x, y's, and z's by moving the, the thing around to three positions on an orthogonal coordinate system. And then uh, the kinetic energy is just analogous to mv squared, m being the inertia, v being the omega for three components, x, y, and uh, z. And the diagonals are the only thing uh, that are off diag are, are the only thing we have to worry about. We don't have to worry about any of the off diagonals if we have picked <coughs> that coordinate uh, frame uh, uh, correctly. So that's the best way to look at it. Then we know there's an ellipsoid that has those um, as their principal axes. So that's what we're going to draw. We're going to draw first the, um, well, we'll do draw both of them at once, the way I've done it here. Uh, there is an ellipsoid for a body, something like, you know, just I, I just get a rectangular, a solid of some kind. Uh, this is just a sketch, but along its long axis there would be a, uh, a um, ellipsoid that was also long. But um, that way of approaching it is the French way. The French, like Lagrange's uh, stuff, uh, the French are going to want to deal with a velocity, the angular velocity. So, um, a, a graduate student, I think, of, of Lagrange, if I'm just speculating, it could have been. His name is Ponceau. Ponceau. Uh, his name, this, this ellipse is called Ponceau ellipse. So, this, that's the French part of this. Okay? Go completely to the other end of the cultural uh, spectrum. This is Russian. You don't see this in any mechanics books, at least I haven't seen it in anyone except Landau and Lifshitz. Landau, big famous Russian physicist. He decided that he didn't want to draw the, those stinky French ellipses. He wanted to do this. And there's a reason to, for that, a very good reason for that. Okay? Now there's a third way to do that, and that's our way. <laughs> and we'll get to that. But uh, th this was adequate. Uh, for uh, doing a much better job of uh, visualizing how a rigid body moves. But we'll look at the French way, too, because it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it's, it's arcane, it's complicated, but it, it also has a certain beauty to it. And that's why it's, I guess, lasting. In any case, here's our kinetic energy. You can think of it as the uh, equation involving the omegas, but then if you have the angular momentum is the inertia tensor dot omega, then you invert that. The omega is I inverse dot L. Okay, so why not rewrite this thing 
this way. Well, first you write it this way, okay, and then you replace uh, either the L or the omega by one of these equations. So here's one quadratic form, here's the Russian one. Okay, the Russian one involves momentum. Now, it's something Hamilton should have done, because that's his way of looking at things, using momentum, right? But he didn't get around to that, as far as I can see. Probably did it real quickly and then just threw it in the wastebasket or put it in some desk shelf. Never published anything about that that I know of. Anyway, whether he did or not, there are the two ways to do it. You can look at uh, the L ellipse and you'll have a tangent point, and that's something I want to show by just redoing that picture that we did uh, quite a while ago. So I'm going to bring this up to speed here and um, we'll, uh, first of all, make the equations that are uh, uh, present here. This, I, I should say, is uh, something you should recall. Right? This is the Lagrangian. We only had a two-dimensional object here. Right? Velocity, velocity for the super balls. Then we had momentum, momentum also, right? And then we had this wonderful relationship where the momentum went up, had a tangent plane that was normal to the velocity, which then pointed at the velocity ellipse to uh, uh, make something uh, that is the original momentum vector perpendicular to that. So there's this wonderful relationship between the V equal gradient of H, okay, and P equal the gradient in the V space of L, okay, inverse M and M. Those are just M1 and M2, right? Same thing we're dealing with here. And then the actual equations, which are shown on the next screen, but I'll, I'll just put it here so you don't have to turn the camera that much. Uh, these equations, first canonic momentum, this is our general formula for it right here, the partial of L with respect to velocity, Q dot. Well, here's the way it looks with the notation that we used. Uh, L is the partial derivative of T with respect to angular velocity. <coughs> gradient and angular velocity space of the kinetic uh, energy. That's this right here. And surprise, surprise, that's I dot omega, which is our basic definition of L in terms of omega. So there's the uh, Hamilton's uh, way, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Hamilton equation. But this is actually well, Lagrange's first equation. So this is Lagrange way of looking at uh, 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 of the thing. And then here's the opposite. Hamilton's first equation is Q dot partial h with respect to p. Okay. You, you kind of just uh, switch the p's and the q's. Okay. And put a dot and take the dot with you as well. Right. So this one is an angular velocity, is the gradient L. Right. So those are the two ways that sort of fight with each other, and one of them, the red one, is the Russian, and the blue is the French. Okay? Lagrange. Lagrange and Putin. Okay. <laughs> well, that's getting a little ahead of time in history. So that that's the basic idea is that you would have uh, a Russian uh, ellipsoid here, and all you'd have to do to figure out how it's going to move, how the L's going to move, all you'd have to do is put a sphere through it that's got a radius equal to the um, L equal constant. Okay, The magnitude of L is not going to change, but in the body frame of the body that's doing a tumbling, wow, uh, L is going to be all over the place. Okay in that frame. And here's where it's going to be able to go. It's going to have to track the intersection of L equal constant with this ellipsoid. So the ellipsoid will have a bunch of contours on it that tell you where the L can persist. Well, that's interesting because finally you get to a point here where you have a saddle point. And uh, it's completely going all the way around. I mean, the L is just turning all the way through this thing, even going to the other side. Uh, very complicated sort of motion. And that's what we, we would like to simplify. We want to understand that a little bit better. So 
what we're going to uh, do here is just go ahead and run a uh, simulation, not a simulation, we're going to run the actual thing here. Then we'll go ahead and we'll look at some other examples of that. But the basic idea here will be to understand, that's the French way of looking at it. You put the angular velocity ellipse between a, a, a magnetic pole faces, I'm just making up the magnet part of it because we were actually thinking of trying to build something like that, then you've got to make a, 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 a ferrous uh, ellipsoid, okay, which will roll around between those two planes. That's the Poisson uh, uh, motion. That, and that just drives most people crazy. They say, I don't want to ever do rotations. This is terrible stuff. Uh, it's hard to uh, visualize. And that's where the Russian comes in and says, no, you go with the angular momentum ellipsoid, and then we've got something even better than that uh, that you'll see in a minute here. But in any case, We've got one right here, an asymmetric uh, uh, object. Now, we started out a sphere, which is not asymmetric. That's perfectly symmetrical. But then I drilled two holes through things. First, I drilled a hole on a lathe, the ball spinning drill stationary, about a 3 8 inch uh, hole that took a brass rod, which you're, you're looking at at the end of, okay, that was about 3 8 And then I took a uh, 5 16 Actually, it's, it's 3 16 uh, brass rod that was perpendicular to that. So you, you chuck the, uh, uh, in the lathe, you chuck up this, and you have a mill that can touch the lathe. That, that's a bit of a, uh, of a, of a deal. Uh, but then you drill the 3 16 and press fit the 3 16 in there. So this thing has maximum inertia around a place where there's no brass at all. All the brass is swinging now, so it's contributing to the inertia. And then you have minimum inertia when you put the big brass rod on the axis, so only the little one is swinging. And then you have the intermediate case that's halfway between that. And that's the one that does the wild uh, singular motions uh, here. This particular thing, the singular pole hold, is the French name for that. Okay, and this is from the paper where we described this device uh, and uh, uh, have built a number of them. One of them is uh, a, a pretty big one. is in the California Museum of Science and Industry. That was really hard to make. Um, I think modern tools we can make it better. So I'm going to go ahead and run this thing. And of course, you can run this, the simulation too. But I've got an ear support here that lets the thing rotate freely. It's not perfectly balanced, so it's it, you can see it's sort of thinking about where it wants to be. And air is trying to convince it uh, one way or the other because it has a different way of flowing over those different parts. But basically what I'm doing is I'm going to take the north pole of this guy as the uh, intermediate eigenvalue uh, axis and go ahead and see if I can get this thing going and it won't stay there. The other side comes up and then this one comes back and then the other side. How many people have seen the movie called The Day the Earth Turned Over? Uh, once more, a movie that no one has seen or should see. <laughs> Somebody set off an atomic bomb and the Earth uh, started doing something like that. Now, every once in a while, it gets stuck. I mean, this is chaotic motion because the air is giving it weird torques. So it, the period of this thing is nothing as clean as what we're going to show uh, in the um, paper that this thing has. This is the calculation of that. And the uh, uh, function is very much like a pendulum. The further uh, you, you get away from the superior, the more it becomes just ordinary periodic motion. But you see that's the actual functions that we're talking about there are the inverse snake functions, okay? They descend the elliptic sine functions, okay? And we talked about that just briefly with a pendulum. Well, here's where it actually calculates what this thing does. Now let's take a look um, at some of the animations. I won't bother. Uh, I, well, I could do it just for the heck of it. Um, let's see if I've got uh, this one right here. That's the uh, animation which is on YouTube. And I'll go ahead and turn the real thing off just so you can see. Um, and I'm doing a very lousy job of setting it up there. But 
I got more speed than I got here when I do it outside. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, now it's north pole this way. Now it's north pole that way. Okay? So far, so good. All right? Uh, that's half of the movie, but we don't need to see too much more of that. Uh, let's go ahead and um, get back to the lecture and look at this one. This one is really cool. Now this one is just a book that somebody threw uh, while they were on the, st on the, on the, uh, the um, space lab. And I've been trying to figure out what the book is, but I can't quite read the, table t t the title. You, if you'll help me there, I'd be happy to know what book it was they had up there in space. But for years I've been asking people to do experiments like this in the space lab where you really would have the thing free of any torques. Well, it happened accidentally. Somebody uh, discovered that when they uh, undid one of these connectors, RF connector, uh, it, it uh, uh, would go crazy. The baby is you gotta go through the ad. What happens if you want to buy a house? You can stop ad in two seconds. There we go. So he unwinds that thing, and that's what it does. One more time. He, there's the connector, and he just takes it out, and if he's really careful, it repeats very nicely. Now he's slow motioning it. Now it's doing, you can see that it's doing the same kind of stuff that our little ball is, but it, on this side it's pretty close to the axis and on the other side it is equivalently close. This one doesn't do that because the torques are weird. Okay? All right. Uh, enough of that one. Try it with a tennis rig. Somebody here does that. That's a famous trick. You, it's really hard to make the thing go like that. It almost always does a spin uh, when you throw it flat. Throw it like this, always right. Okay? And same thing with this. You do any of the other three axes, they're stable. They don't have that separatrix. Okay, um, let's go back. I want to show you uh, this thing eventually. We have to go through some stuff here to get to that. This is where NASA really <laughs> screwed up on something. And uh, uh, the story is told uh, the, in, on those pages. Uh, and this is Rick Heller. He was recently here for a seminar. And he has loved all of the stuff that we've done with rotation, so he's making a book about it uh, now. Anyway, these guys, <laughs> as the handle spins out, dips down a bit before becoming detached, letting your mind bug, uh, requires a flat block. It's just garbage. And so this guy says, so you're saying when they put their hands on the tip, I dip, you dip, we dip. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> see and then somebody finally says, it sounds like you have a handle on what's going on there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's about what you get from <laughs> yes, people studying rotations. <laughs> uh, very seldom do we get. But anyway, this is the um, French way, and those are the French uh, um, angular velocity ellipsoid. Uh, here's the calculation. Actually, Euler did something like this uh, with the pendulum, so we, we do it here uh, with the uh, thing. Now, here is um, Heller's uh, deal. This is a text in preparation by Rick Heller. He's the one that wrote the book on. Why You Hear What You Hear. It's a big, thick book on sound. Get it if you want to know anything about music and sound. It's really cool. It's a really neat book. Anyway, uh, just to go through the thing here, uh, Rockets Are Not Rigid Body points out. And this particular one made by Thompson Raymond Woolbridge for the NASA JPL, first really good astronomical, astrophysical satellite. Uh, it's the one that um, discovered the James Van Allen belt, okay, which is a big deal. Okay, the thing that makes your auroras. Okay, they mapped it. Uh, first mapping was this. Okay. Now, as he says, and then there's Werner von Braun and William Pickering. These are all famous people. It's just mostly. Um, there with a full-size model of the satellite just after it was successfully orbited in 1958. At this press conference took, the satellite was busy tumbling out of control. Now I can demonstrate that with a bottle of correction fluid. 
okay? The uh, correction fluid in there is going to waste energy. This one doesn't, this one's dried out. So I can throw this one, you know, spin it, and it, it, it will, I can usually get it to be pretty stable. This one I try to do the same thing and it never works. See it, it wobble? It goes for a while, even if I'm really good at throwing it, and pretty soon it's like this. That's what happened to this thing. And what Rick is doing is he's showing our rotational energy surface field, and I'm going to show that in just a minute. But the rotational energy surface plots the um, energy versus the, the uh, uh, direction of the angular momentum. Just plot it radially. So here's a, a high region, okay, and that's where it was. And all it takes is a little bit of wobble for it to waste energy. So the uh, what, what, what happens is the thing is going to go down in contours here. It can't change the total angular momentum, but it can sure change the energy. And that's the lowest energy right there. And that's where it heads. So then it goes across the superatrix. When it goes across the superatrix, that's when they're having the press conference. It's just crazy. Okay? But then it's settled down like this. And as he says here, these bristling antennas gave a useful uh, 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 data. They could still read it. Okay? And then he explains uh, where this tumbling comes and what it, it uh, has. And thanks us for our, you know, rotational energy search. He just loved those things. And they're, they are lovable. And I'm going to try to explain them a little bit. Here are two ways to do it. This is the Russian way right here. That's a constant energy surface. That's where you plot E versus JX, JYZ, wherever JX, JYZ may uh, want to be. It's a function of those three variables. Okay? This one is a function of the directions of those variables. So these are, uh, the idea is that here you plot the actual energy that the thing would have if you were to just put an axis and make the thing rotate uh, around it. So the, the energy here, this thing right here, are harmonics. What you'll see here is a combination of an S wave and a P wave shape. This is a spherical harmonic Y1 plus a constant uh, and minus 1 so that it has symmetry. There are the actual functions uh, right there. Okay, so. This one is going to be giving the same contours as this one, but this one looks more like the actual object that it is uh, reproducing. Uh, in this case, uh, a water molecule uh, would be sitting inside there with the, um, this is H2O with the oxygen atom pointing along what the J2, the unstable axis. So a water molecule, uh, like the tennis racket and like the satellite, um, is asymmetric top. And when I rotate this thing, it's really hard to keep the black thing uh, on that side. Okay? See it flip back? Very quickly flips back. I didn't do a very good throw. But if I throw perfectly, it would, that's a bad throw again. It was back and forth in, in very short time. You can play with these things. See how, how, how often you can make the thing so it stays here and then goes there and then there. In other words, get a low period oscillation like this one right here. It's really hard to get that, just like it's really hard to balance a pendulum upside down. Idea for problem is to do parametric amplification of this kind of motion. Okay. Now here's, here's another example right here. But here's where it goes into quantum mechanics. This is what's so cool. This is just a, a rotational energy surface for uh, CO2. Okay, and CO2 looks like that, okay? But when you, when you throw it in the air, air just randomly, it'll persist. Uh, you just go like this, go, just throw it around. You see the thing go like that? That would be in one of these states right here, or this one. If you want a thing to just go in the end, just like that, well, then you're right about here. And then you go around, you see, uh, depending on the slope, the more slope you have relative to the radius, the faster you go around. 
That's what's so cool about the rotational energy surface. One of the things that's so cool. But the main thing that's really cool is if you take angular momentum literally, if you take that the magnitude of angular momentum has to be the square root of j times j plus 1, not the square root of j squared, which would just be j, right? The magnitude of the angular momentum is j plus a half. In this case, it's approximate, exactly about 10.488 here for angular momentum 10. Say 10.5, okay? So this is j equal 10. k equal 10 means you're up at the level 10, but that's not enough to make it all the way to 10 and a half. So you have a cone there with a width to it, and that's called the minimum uncertainty angle for angular momentum. So if you're riding this thing in space and you can see the angular momentum, the angular momentum is going to just be going around that little circle right there. Then you kick yourself with a rocket or something so that you get the thing over here. It's going to go around this circle. Now you're going to probably get sick to the stomach because you're going to be doing a lot of wobbling, right? And finally here you're just turning end over end. And then it goes the other way down here. So that's a really neat way to look at quantum angular momentum. And sure enough, it, there's the asymmetric top. You can see the, how the levels of this, this stuff is coming in the course that we're going to be giving uh, in the uh, spring semester. The separatrix turns out to be a plane, two, two planes intersecting each other at an angle that's easily calculatable. This is going from asymmetric lob right here to oblate to prolate uh, objects, bowling pin versus frisbee or discus. Okay, but this is where it really gets powerful. When you have a molecule like this, or methane, this one is really uh, just like that shape, but this is the rotational energy plotted versus the uh, um, direction of the angular momentum vector. And the idea is that you have really pretty high energy when you spin it this way because it's rigid in that direction. These are radial bonds, SF6, really strong. But if you start spinning it around this axis right here, the centrifugal force spreads the bonds, makes the inertia go up, but remember the inertia is in the denominator, so the energy comes down. If you're right about there, that's a low point. So this is how you can analyze the mechanics, both classical and quantum, using those cones for a molecule of this complexity and symmetry. So there are the actual quantum energy levels that are being attained just by putting cones through this thing. And there's this little messy region right here where it switches over to uh, rotating around this uh, stuff here. And so the cones there are completely different geography. This is a different chemical than this one. So I put SS6 is spinning like this. That's one chemical. This is the other chemical. It really takes a long time for them to change into each other. This is something that really wasn't appreciated. A completely new type of physical chemistry or chemical physics uh, came out of this. The Hamiltonian, really simple, it's the fourth power added to uh, just the ordinary uh, sphere that's associated with a, a, a rigid molecule of this shape. And what's interesting is both the ground state and the excited state have the same topography, so I can just take the topography, slice it, and literally match each one of these energy levels to a particular cone. In other words, by ruler and compass, I do something that required an enormous computer diagonalizing at the time that this was done, when the computers were not so powerful. Now they are. We can diagonalize these things with our browser. We're going to do that, <laughs> make good, much better pictures. So that that's the uh, pretty much the end of the stuff that I want to talk about today, I'll just skim real quickly through what's also in, in Unit 6, and that are where the cones are classical. This is a symmetric top again. Depending on how your inertias uh, relate to each other, uh, you will have a large cone or a small cone, and it'll be inside or it'll be outside, depending on your initial conditions. And uh, here's one uh, where you have a, a ratio of 8 ninths and then one ninth uh, for the uh, little guy here. And these are all doing cycloidal motion. Sometimes it's an hypocycloid, sometimes it's an epicycloid, but it's, class it's classical motion that uh, 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 rotors do, so you do detailed analysis of that. 
Now, the rest of this we've all had before. Remember I said we pushed this stuff uh, early on. This was your hockey stick uh, problem uh, or a, a pull thing. And then this is the setting the bumper. Uh, we have two examples of pool hall stuff today. Your vacation's coming up, so, you know, have fun with uh, why the heights of that thing has to be a particular uh, value uh, so the ball does not skid. That's the uh, answer right there. It has to be seven-tenths of the diameter of the ball in order to hit it at the percussion point. With that, we only have relativity and quantum mechanics to do for the classical mechanics class. So I've enjoyed giving the class, and I hope you've enjoyed taking it. We'll uh, talk some more about all of this.